Wow. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, at TED, they told me to think big. And uh, the big story I want to bring today is uh, I'm going to tell you a happy story about racism and discrimination. I know, please don't roll your eyes just yet, because if there is one thing I know is that we here in Belgium, we really don't like uh, to speak about racism and discrimination. I know this because uh, I grew up here in Belgium, here in Antwerp, actually. And for the longest time, I was convinced myself that there is no such thing as racism. My sister and I, we grew up with our white Flemish parents in the uh, Antwerp suburb, in Medicsim, actually. And uh, my take on racism was that if you put your mind to it, and if you really work hard, you can get anything you want in life. Because that's the life that I was living, or at least the life I thought I was living. But... Uh, Along the way, growing up, I had to change my mind about this. And uh, strangely enough, this was not a sad event. Actually, it was a, a quite happy event because by traveling around in Europe and growing up with um, a different skin than uh, the average person in Western Europe, uh, I have been forced to open uh, my mind to see things differently. And I guess this is the happy story I want to share with you uh, today. Because apart from growing up uh, with this uh, different skin color, uh, also, part of my blessing was the fact that I had the chance to grow up in a white, protected environment, which gave me a sense of uh, normality. And it's this sense of normality that I, I started realizing that I think everybody, uh, regardless of culture or religious background, actually has uh, the right to feel and is entitled to. So let me start with uh, a story, and it was in the spring of um, 2006. And Antwerp had been shaken by uh, the targeted killings done by a young man uh, called Hans van Temsche. He went around town uh, with a gun and he started shooting around. And he uh, killed a two-year-old Luna and her uh, nanny from Mali, Ulematu. And before that, he also uh, wounded a, a Turkish uh, woman, Sangul. She was just sitting on a bench and reading a book. Anyway, it, sh it shook up the city, actually. And uh, in a rare um, show of unity and solidarity, all the communities of Antwerp had come together to march against uh, this uh, useless violence. And uh, I was working downtown at that time, so during my lunch break, I uh, took my bike and I went to see the march. And it was quite a view, actually. I was, I was moved, I had to say. And um, next to me comes uh, an older man. He gets off his bike and he stands next to me to, just like me, watch um, this, um, this march. And uh, he turns to me and he says, uh, so where are you from? And you have to know I'm really used to these kind of conversations because I have so many of them. So uh, usually I know the right answers to make it like a really smooth conversation. But this time I was a bit, you know, taken by the moment and I heard from his accent that he was from Antwerp. So I said, uh, just like you, I'm from Antwerp. Uh, isn't this great? And uh, he said, no, no, where are you really from? So obviously I snapped back in the normal uh, way of this conversation. And I said, you know, my parents are from Rwanda, uh, but I was born here in Belgium and I grew up in Antwerp. And uh, he said, uh-huh, so are you a refugee? And I said, uh, no, not really. I just told you, you know, that I was born in Belgium. But anyway, so I was a bit surprised because normally you usually get uh, immediately to the next uh, comment, and that is, oh, my, you speak Dutch so well. Like, in, uh, <laughs> in, uh, in Antwerp. <laughs> so in, uh, yeah, in Antwerp slang, that would sound like, I might have speak two Netherlands. So anyway, um, the fact that I repeated that I grew up in Antwerp didn't stop him from uh, saying, I might have speak two Netherlands. So anyway, I was thinking, let's uh, change the game a bit. And instead of having this type of interrogation, let's make it a conversation. So I asked him, so, sir, where are you from? So for people that are not from Antwerp or Belgium, maybe you should imagine that two people are standing uh, somewhere in Manhattan. They're both from New York. They hear it from their accents. And the one is saying, I'm from Brooklyn, right? So the guy, uh, to his credit, he did not just say, you know, I'm from here. No, he said... Uh, I'm from Marzo. So I was like really happy that we kind of had a conversation, but he kind of ruined it by saying, do you know where that is? So, you know, it's, <laughs> I, um, I'm actually not telling you this story to make fun of this guy, because if I have to be honest, I have had the similar type of conversations with uh, many people, and that would have been young people, old people, uh, educated people or not, uh, white people or people of color that grow up here. 
The reason I'm telling this story is that it taught me a lot about um, the colonized mind. And um, what struck me in this conversation with this guy is that he was seeing me because he came up to me and wanted to talk to me. But at the same time, uh, because of all the knowledge he had had uh, during his life about people of color, he was not capable of hearing me or seeing me. So somehow I was silenced uh, and I was standing there in front of him. But by the knowledge he already had before that, he was unable to hear me or see me. But as you can imagine, it's not this type of conversation that made, convinced me that there is such, such thing as racism in society. Um, for one, if it taught me something, it's actually that stereotypical thinking or even racist thinking is not something uh, that has anything to do with good people versus bad people. It's much more to the type of information uh, we are uh, exposed to during our lives in our own society. So it took me to go and move to Italy to study, uh, to actually realize what this silencing can do in practice. And um, that was actually not because uh, Italy is such a much more racist society than Belgium, because it isn't. So you would have men that would assume that I was a prostitute, or you would have people that would be really surprised that I could read and write, even though I was there, there to do my, uh, my PhD. But also, again, this type of reaction, doesn't, they don't touch you if you're there to study, if you're in a good situation. Um, what really changed me is uh, the friends that I had in Italy. And I had many more uh, African friends or other friends of color than I ever had in, in Belgium. And I had first-hand knowledge about their skills. Uh, many of them uh, had degrees. Most of them spoke at least three languages, which would be like two more languages than any average Italian at that time. Um, and uh, still, the way that they were treated in society, they, they, their person as themselves, they were being silenced by Italian society, and I could feel it much more myself because I felt like a foreigner. But uh, so what happened is, uh, apart from, from their skills, uh, they only had access to really horrible jobs. They were treated like illiterates. They were working on the streets, selling bags, whatever, and uh, constantly chased, chased by the police. So this is the moment, actually, that I, I, I saw and I felt firsthand what a systematic way of uh, racism and discrimination can come out of this silencing of people, the people right in front of us. So, and this brings me to my... Uh, colonization story, because uh, maybe by now you must have been thinking, uh, when is she going to come up with the, <laughs> the colony story? Uh, that is, if you're still listening, of course. But the thing is, um, the point I want to make today, I think, is that the mindset that made it possible that we had the colonial times like we know them is a type of mindset that we, is still very much alive and still very much present in our societies today. It's the mindset that makes types of uh, discrimination and racism not only possible, but also ex acceptable to many people, but also invisible. Because if you're honest, isn't it logic that we exclude undocumented migrants from our labor market. We like to call them illeg illegals. Or isn't it logic that uh, we ban failed women from the classroom or from, from these uh, jobs? And also, isn't it a bit logical that the police searches uh, young Moroccan men more often than others just to make sure? I can imagine that your first reaction might be like, this is not racism, come on. And uh, I would wanna say that I don't think it's really important which label we give to this. There are examples, however we uh, change this or however we look at it, there are examples of uh, st uh, structural forms of discrimination against certain groups. And it's not just that there are forms of discrimination, it's forms of discrimination we feel like logical and we feel like acceptable in many cases. And um, I think I wanna make a case for decolonization because um, it's something uh, in the past we were wrong about many of these things, and we might be wrong today as well. But um, I think I promised you a happy story, right? And I might have been slipping <laughs> in the last minutes. So let me get back to the happy story, and that is the decolonization story. Because actually I think that um, decolonization is uh, an opportunity, because if the colo colo colonized mind is the mind that silences people and stories, then decolonization means desilencing, and it means digging deeper and going after stories. So in itself, it's actually a, a force or um, um, a source of, of creativity, like endless creativity. 
And let me give you uh, an example from my own professional uh, life. Uh, last um, June, I was in Frankfurt with uh, some of my uh, colleagues from other European universities. And um, we organized a conference called uh, the decolonization of the social sciences. So the logic is the same. We try to uh, dig up stories from the, in the social sciences that have been silenced for so many decades. And it's not an, an activity that you say, oh, we go in the library, dig in the books, and start reading stuff that we haven't uh, read before. No. Decolonization of the social sciences in that sense meant that we have to bring in new people because there are so many people around the world already doing stuff that we just have not access to. So, I mean, I've been in research more than 10 years, and it was the first time that I was sitting around the table discussing ideas, methodology, with uh, people from universities from the so-called Global South. So I had people from China, Brazil, many African countries, and I have to say it was really inspirational. And one specific thing that, that I want to share with you here is, for instance, that I, I, I discovered political scientists from uh, Nigeria that have oh, theories about state building in Africa, for instance. And I never heard of them, although I've been working on Africa for such a long time. And I mean, I also can imagine that uh, you might think, uh, so who cares, whatever. But uh, it becomes slightly more relevant uh, for the general public if you think that I might be teaching this class um, at my university in Ghent. And I pass on the same bias to my students. And the bias is that uh, we teach about Africa as a place that needs help. So we're going to specialize ourselves and our students in figuring ways how, for instance, the European Union can uh, perfect its development policies. So that's the class I teach. But what we also say at the same time, of what we silence, is the fact that uh, Africa is also a place that produces so many people that come up with their own solutions. And we don't see it necessary to teach this to our, our students. And again, I mean, as long as it's inside the university, who cares, right? But um, these students, they graduate, they're bright young students, and uh, they go on and become journalists, policy makers, or aid workers. So people that actually make decisions about state building in Africa or um, um, uh, spread the word or spread the same bias as journalists to the general public. So I think my very last point I want to make, and I think it's the most important one, um, is that I think it's important that we uh, democratize this decolonization idea. That means that not everybody goes to university to, to get a degree. And I think, especially in Western Europe, where um, we have a democratic system and the whole society is involved in political decisions, I think it's very important that we, um, that we put attention to the, the decolonization of the mainstream minds so of every one of us. And the best way to do that, obviously, is um, through um, the, our general education system. If I think the things that I learned in school about the colonial times, it's actually really a joke. And it explains so much of the non-understanding that there is for uh, people of the general public towards uh, many other uh, communities and many other places uh, in the world. Another very important thing, because uh, I think most of us don't go to school anymore, is, uh, is the general public, reaching the general public to uh, the media. So I think it's important that uh, journalists um, get the space to dig deeper and go for stories and these silent stories that have not been told yet and not just sensationalized stories that are hardly interesting. Sorry. <laughs> but, uh, and I think it's also important to, to realize that to do that, we might just have to decolonize the, the media themselves, like not making them, um, like, like the capitalist idea of, of consumers and viewers is very dominant in the way we produce knowledge. And, and I think it's important that we, we, we think of that. But the, the most uh, gratifying, the most fun way to decolonize ourselves is maybe also uh, through, the, um, uh, through fiction. I mean, I think there you can feel how decolonization might be really uh, a very creative way. And uh, let me stop with this very um, happy example I find myself. It's that uh, last year, uh, Jan Verheyen, most of you might know him, uh, he's a Belgian filmmaker. He made uh, an Antwerp adaptation of the movie Love Actually. And for those of you who don't know, the plot is you have many different uh, couples and people in one city. The background is uh, the holiday season. This time it was the, the arrival of St. Nicholas in the, in the port of Antwerp. 
But the idea is that, you know, you have the usual romantic comedy drama uh, plots and they, they meet along the way. And, uh, well, I'm a sucker for um, Hollywood uh, type movies, so I went to see the movie and I enjoyed it really much. But um, because there were many places of this city that I recognized and also many of the, of, of the situations the characters were in. But I couldn't help but notice that none of the main characters, or, and there were many of them, uh, none of them was of non-European descent. And, I mean, even that I can understand because it was uh, mostly a, a middle-class uh, middle uh, character, so that would fit with uh, how society is here. But you have to know that Antwerp, I think we can, it's safe to say that 40% of people uh, living in Antwerp are from non-European descent. So a whole movie without any meaningful character of non-European descent. But what was more striking is that even the long shot of the mare, like uh, the shopping street here, was actually white. So I was like, how can you do this? Like, you must have... But apart from that, uh, <laughs> why, why this is a happy example for me is that, on the other hand, uh, several of the main characters were, were gay couples. And, and there I saw how you actually can, can do it. And, and they were portrayed in a very nuanced way and different angles. And um, it went even further, because I know at some point, one of, of the gay couples, they actually got married in a Catholic church with a priest. And as far as I know, I think this is almost really fictional, because I don't think today the Vatican would, you know, uh, approve of this. So what I wanted to say, actually, is that for me, decolonizing our minds is, is, is a source of, of creation and endless uh, discovery. And um, I think it would be a good idea if we put a bit more effort into it, because uh, after 32 years on this planet, I realized that it's not something that just falls out of the sky. So let me end with um, these uh, couple of points. First of all, I hope you understood that it's not a story about uh, race or religion or, or culture. I think decolonization is about what type of information is available for our mainstream societies. Secondly, it's also not about political correctness. It's not about silencing yourself or not saying things uh, you say uh, you think uh, you're not supposed to say. It is actually the opposite. It's, um, it's a call to, to dig deeper, and um, it's something that every one of you can do uh, in whatever profession you have, I think. And um, lastly, I think also it's something that is uh, very much day-to-day uh, -day because the, the story of the bike man I started with, it's just a very day-to-day -day conversations you can have. So I think decolonizing our minds means that, first of all, whenever you feel silenced yourself, you or your group or whomever uh, you're part of, that you step up and, and take it upon yourself to, to tell your story and, and, and take the stage, <laughs> like I'm doing now. But secondly, I think it's, it's important that whenever you're in front of someone and you have a conversation to actually uh, really listen to what the person is saying. So uh, I think I've been lucky today because I see that you have been listening to me, and I want to thank you very much for that. Right.